Welcome to this podcast from the Unitarian Universalist Church of Reading, Massachusetts. I'm Rev. Tim Cutsmark, the minister of this regional church serving communities north of Boston. We are an intentionally inclusive congregation, welcoming people of all ages, beliefs, religious backgrounds, cultural origins, differing abilities, and sexual orientations. If you are in the area, know that you are invited to join us for Sunday services. For more information on our church or on Unitarian Universalism, please visit our website at www.uureading.org. That's www.uureading.org. And now, Please enjoy this podcast of the sermon. Beautiful. Will you please join me in a moment of prayer? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do any of you go home on Fridays and watch movies on TV? You don't. (laughs) I was really into it for a while, but then my DVD player broke, so I haven't done it for a while, but one night I watched The Cleaner. Has anyone seen it? I've never asked that question that even one person has said yes. Samuel L. Jackson plays a former police detective who owns a company that cleans up death scenes, cleans up the remnants of heartache and disappointment, as his character puts it. The opening scene takes place at his 30th high school reunion and everybody's standing around awkwardly having their drinks and making small talk about what they've been doing for the past 30 years. And someone asks the cleaner what he does now that he's not a detective anymore. So he responds with the utmost respect and compassion that's necessary for telling an ugly truth. He says, I handle the remnants of heartache and disappointment so that people can go about the business of healing. Most people don't know this, but when someone dies in your home, you're left to clean it up. The classmates look confused. He shares in vivid detail right down to the special mixture he created out of Listerine to uncoagulate blood, and everyone's horrified. Their mouths are agape. They're truly uncomfortable, shifting from one foot to another, coughing nervously. So noticing their discomfort, he changes the subject, tries to divert their attention to something else, and asks one of the guys what he's been doing for the last 30 years, and the guy says what people say at high school reunions all the time. Oh, married to the same woman since college, the kids are great, playing a little golf, just got a bigger house so that my mother-in-law could move in with us. She lives up in the upstairs room. She almost never comes out. (laughs) Someday she won't come out. And then a funny look of realization flits across his face, and he says to the cleaner, um... Can I have one of your cards? <laughs> sure, comes the response. Sooner or later, everyone needs us. And one at a time, each person in the group comes forward to receive a card. The opening scene kind of touched me in a peculiar way because it felt familiar. People who deal with death knows, know what it feels like to be a skunk at a lawn party. It's pretty much how people react when I tell them what I do. Initial discomfort that such a service is necessary, following, followed by the realization that almost everybody needs hospice care for themselves or a loved one eventually, and finally the realization that the person standing in front of them, who tends to the very deepest of sorrows, does so from a place of great compassion and love, and then they ask for my card. Love and loss and longing, those are the themes that I work with every day in my ministry. I love my job, but the most frequent question I get asked is, isn't it depressing? It isn't depressing. It isn't depressing. Sometimes it's terribly sad, but it's not depressing because depression is an isolating, lonely, dark place, whereas sadness is something that all of us feel at times, and when we're able to hear somebody's sadness and our hearts meet, it's the antithesis of depressing. It's a joining. It's a, it's a meeting. It's being within a communion, a community of caring. And that's energizing. It's not depressing. I have a poem for you. It's entitled The Happiest Day by Linda Poston, and it goes like this. 
It was early May, I think, a moment of lilac or dogwood, when so many promises are made that it hardly matters if a few are broken. My mother and father still hovered in the background, part of the scenery like the houses I had grown up in. And if they would be torn down later, that was something I knew but didn't believe. Our children were asleep or playing, the youngest as new as the smell of lilacs. How could I have guessed their roots were shallow and would be easily transplanted? I didn't even guess that I was happy. The small irritations are like, that are like salt on melon were what I dwelt on, though in truth they simply made the fruit taste sweeter. So we sat on the porch in the cool morning, sipping hot coffee. Behind the news of the day, strikes and small wars, a fire somewhere. I could see the top of your dark head and thought not of public conflagrations, but of how it would feel on my bare shoulder. If someone could stop the camera then, if someone could only stop the camera and ask me, are you happy? Perhaps I would have noticed how the morning shone in the reflected color of lilac. Yes, I might have said, and offered a steaming cup of coffee. The ordinary is as good as it gets. The very sacred ordinary is as good as it gets. Do you know what people talk about when they're dying? <clears throat> we talk about love pretty much exclusively. When we come to the end of our lives and the conversation has narrowed down to what was the point of me, people reflect on love. It's true that dying people never ever talk about the unfinished business that they have at work. Never have I had that conversation. We talk about the unfinished business in our intimate relationships. We talk about the loves that made us whole, the loves that gave us joy and meaning and pride, and we talk about the loves that broke our hearts. <clears throat> we talk about the ones that we loved well and the ones that we forsook. We talk about the intimate love of family and dear friends and the love of humanity that compels us to reach out to strangers in our professional and private lives. People are made for love. We're made to love. The measure of a life well lived is always and only found in a person's courage in loving. But even though our lives are meant to be a love story, we learn along the way that all love stories end in tragedy. Whether through choice or through death, there's always somebody left grieving. <clears throat> Leaving friends and family and home for school or work or marriage is a kind of a death. Broken relationships are a death. Divorce is a death. The end of life is a death. And the grief that goes with any heartbreak, the grief that goes with any death is heartbreaking. It only takes one experience of grief before a person begins to brace themselves for the next. Losses compound, they don't lessen. Here now, Maya Angelou's poem, No Loser, No Weeper. I hate to lose something. Then she bent her head, not even a dime. I wish I was dead. I can't explain it. There's no more to be said, except I hate to lose something. I lost a doll once and cried for a week. She could open her eyes and do all but speak. I believe she was took by some doll-snatching sneak. I tell you, I hate to lose something. A watch of mine once got up and walked away. It had 12 numbers on it for the time of day. I never forgot it. And all I can say is I really hate to lose something. Now, if I felt that way about a watch and a toy, what do you think I feel about my lover boy? I ain't threatening you, madam, but he's my evening's joy, and I mean I really hate to lose something. We start to brace ourselves, and it's no wonder because when a, our, our hearts break, they hurt. They hurt the feeling of ripping and aching in our chest, the agony of waking up because we are sobbing, and the feeling of being completely consumed by loss and feeling hopeless. It only takes once before, like ducking before a bee after you've been stung, or panicking in deep water, or looking over your shoulder when walking through a dark square, you start to brace yourself. It becomes embodied. <clears throat> My eldest daughter, Mari, loaned me a trashy novel this past winter. It was a light read. Nevertheless, just as even the most simple people sometimes say marvelous things, even the most simplest books can have a little gem of wisdom in them. This is from Cecilia Ahern's book, If You Could See Me Now. 
When you drop a glass of wine or a plate to the ground, it makes a loud crashing sound. When a window shatters, a table leg breaks, or a picture falls off the wall, it makes noise. But as for your heart, when it breaks, it is completely silent. You would think, as it was so important, that it would make the loudest sound in the whole world, or even have some sort of ceremonious sound like the gong of a cymbal or the ringing of a bell, but it's silent, and you almost wish there was a noise to distract you from the pain. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? When a heart breaks, it is completely silent. W.H. Auden is one of my favorite poets. He wrote a poem about the death of his beloved, which was made popular in the movie Four Weddings and a Funeral. His poem, Funeral Blues, captures the initial sense of hopeless longing in that initial experience of grief. Funeral Blues. Stop all the clocks. Cut off the telephone. Prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone. Silence the pianos and with muffled drum bring out the coffin. Let the mourners come. Let airplanes circle, moaning overhead, scribble on the sky the message, he is dead. Put crepe bows around the white necks of the public doves. Let the traffic policemen wear white, black cotton gloves. He was my north, my south, my east, my west, my working week and my Sunday rest, my noon, my midnight, my talk, my song. I thought that love would last forever. I was wrong. The stars are not wanted now. Put out every one. Pack up the moon and dismantle the sun. Pour away the ocean and sweep up the woods. For nothing now can ever come to any good. I hope, I pray that for Auden, that initial feeling of nothing ever being good again passed. I know that in the months following my nephew Mark's sudden death at age seven, none of us ever imagined that his parents would smile again. But then, unexpectedly, like a rainbow arching over the deep, wild, mysterious ocean, something struck my sister-in-law funny one night at dinner, and she laughed. And it was a beginning. We never stopped missing Mark, of course. His life and his love and his death shaped our lives and expanded our souls. But his mother's laughter was testimony that there is yet hope and joy and life to be had even after so great a loss. Something good is always waiting to be had, eventually. But loss is the price that we pay for living into our purpose, which is to love. Love, loss, longing, they're all of one piece, life. She Came and Went by James Russell Lowell. As a twig trembles, which a bird lights on to sing, then leaves unbent, so my memory is thrilled and stirred. I only know she came and went. As clasped some lake by gusts unriven, the blue dome's measureless content, so my soul held that moment's heaven. I only know she came and went. As at one bound, our swift spring heaps the orchards full of bloom and scent. So clove her may my wintry sleeps. I only know she came and went. An angel stood and met my gaze. Through the low doorway of my tent, the tent is struck. The vision stays. I only know she came and went. Oh, when the room grows slowly dim and life's last oil is nearly spent, One gush of light my eyes shall see, only to think she came and went. Yes, he went. Yes, she left. But first she came. She came in all of her glory. He came with all of his delights. They came with their strengths and with their foibles. They came, and you and I are who we are because they came in their fullness, and we loved them. We loved them. In a million years, in just one precious lifetime, would you change that truth? The truth that they came into our lives and part of that beloved one, parent, friend, lover, child, spouse, was in your life and shaped your very being and you shaped them simply by loving, simply by loving. Yes, they went, but first they came and lived 
and loved you. Every day I keep company with men and women and children who are dying and with their families. It can be a time of profound grace. The spirit can grow stronger even while the body is growing weaker. It can be a time to look back and pay honor to and close out a life. Sacred, sacred time. There are four phrases that chaplains often offer to people who are dying and those that they love the most to facilitate sacred conversations. I love you. I'm sorry for what has gone badly between us and for my part in it, and I ask your forgiveness. I forgive you for the parts that you played in it, and I thank you for your role in my life. There's no need to wait for such sacred conversations. We can have them any time and be blessed by the sharing of them. I leave you with a little reflection on love from Dr. Peter Kreef. What to say to the dying? The profoundest thing you can ever say to a dying person is I love you. Even God never said anything more profound than that. <laughs>